Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. I hope you, you can all hear. It was uh, such a privilege to hear Colin and Richard just now. Absolutely wonderful to hear. And I, I knew you regret us. They're not in the book. <laughs> Another book. Anyway, um, it was very nice of Simon to mention my book of poems because it has a cover by Tessa, of course. And this cover is from Tessa's series on a collection of bird's eggs she was bequeathed by a great uncle. And the whole idea of collecting bird's eggs is now complete anathema, but it wasn't when they were collected. But Tessa has redeemed the collection by turning them into planets. So I'm most grateful to Tessa, among many other things, for gratitude for having this on my book. I just want to mention that um, it has a strange title, this book, which is The Thermobaric Playground. And I chose it because thermobaric is a word that most of us would not have known until February of this year, when Ukraine was invaded by Russia. It's the name of the vacuum bombs that Putin likes to drop on um, preschools. So, I must say, I was terribly thrilled to find that somebody had bought my book from the store this morning. And the book is actually published today. So this is the first book sold to a complete stranger. And it's a bit like the England men's football team scoring a goal in open play. <laughs> so it's a very thrilling moment for me, and thank you, the angelic person Bought it. Now, when I retired in, um, from the v &A in 2004 at the age of um, 60, which was then the rule, nowadays they work until they drop, as Ella from tell us, um, um, I, I was sort of slightly wondering what, what I might do, and Tessa said suddenly, um, if you'd like to work with me on my book in the Vivare in the Ardèche, you would need to come before the great markets closed down at the end of September. So there I was for my first visit to the Vivare, a very remote plateau in the Ardèche, which Tessa had been working on for, oh, I don't know, at least 10 years. 15 years. 15. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yes, I started working there in... Close to your mouth, I think. Um, 93, actually, and uh, I was invited to um, recall the local patrimoine and in fact I was commissioned by the town hall and um, I thought it would be the most wonderful project but um, I think we might start to describe this picture above us here because um, it was, uh, it was a self-portrait that I did in the last week when I was in my studio in Chelsea and it was a lovely life we had. There were nine artists all in the studio block and we were very happy there. And the Cadogan estate decided to double or triple all our rents. So we all had to leave. And this was me packing up and leaving. And fortunately, Vogue decided to do a feature on lady photographers. So I was one of the lady photographers and I did my self-portrait. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that as I was packing up, I realized that my life was going to be completely different. I brought all my equipment to Devon, and I started doing much more work on location and never really used the studio very much anymore. And this is a picture of all the equipment that I had to take on location when I went away, which was filling practically the entire boot of the car. And um, I worked on a large format camera. I had to have um, buckets to develop my film and many lenses and tripods. And then in the front was a picture of my in the microphone, please. current um, equipment, which I carry on my show in one bag. So you can see there's a major difference between film and, and the modern digital way. And I'm not trying to prove that it's better. Either way, they're totally different. 
but it is a very different way of life. Should we move to the vivre? So we went down to the vivre, and at that time, this was actually long before this all happened, um, I was working on a large format camera, and so we had to take all the equipment, the tripods and the buckets to develop the Polaroid film and so on. And um, this picture is in fact, I took two types of cameras with me. One was my Nikon 35mm, and one was my big camera. And this first photograph was taken on the Nikon, and we're going to go to the next photograph, which is of Mart, I think. Um, well, no, this one is of a loaf of bread, and that is on a large format camera. So you can see the difference. You get a marvelous detail and a very soft, beautiful feeling, um, and even with absolutely no grain. So it's, they make the most wonderful prints. Um, but of course, if they go into publication, they have to be scanned, so they all end up digital in the end. But if you're making prints, then you do get a lovely, lovely look. So the next one, I think, is going to I be it is of Mart, I think, isn't it? No, it isn't, actually. Uh, Should we go to straight to Mart? Yes, let's go straight to Mart. So... Oh, we seem to have gone all past on wrong. Sorry, she's disappeared. <laughs> there she is. Yes. There's Mark. So Mark Charles was a farmer. She lived on her own up, up a mountain. And the only way to get up there was to walk. There was no road. So we dragged all the cameras up the mountain and the tripods and so on. And I set up my, my tripod and my buckets of chemicals which I developed the Polaroid film them. And she was incredibly intrigued by what was going on. And you can see that she's watching me really carefully. And to her amazement, I got out my plastic buckets, were well, almost identical to the ones she used to make her cheese. So she felt completely at home with me and realized that we were both artisans. And she looked at me I mean, by this time I, I could speak quite good French, I, I learned the dialect. But she, she looked at me and she said, I know who you are, and I think you know who I am. And it was a wonderful mm, theatrical moment, you know, we were really... She's still up there, yes? We were still at one with each other. And I, I wanted to make the point, really, that I think cameras affect the photograph because she was reacting to my way of photographing, my artisan way, and it was very difficult and complicated, but ultimately a beautiful result. Whereas um, later, we, we left, we left the, the, the uh, little farm and went out walking with the goats, and I took a very nice passing shot of her on the 35mm camera, which should be up there. There it is, yes. And it was a lovely, funny moment. The goat was trying to eat, to eat the chestnuts from her basket. And it's very grainy, and it's a perfectly valid portrait of her as well, her in action. And, but it was the camera that made the difference. When I was walking along with my Nikon, she felt relaxed, and she got on with her life. And I was doing really more what James did. I, I was just there and she didn't notice me too much. And I think that it's quite interesting that most of the argument is whether film is better or analog is better, but actually it's much more about the camera and the ideas that the photographer has and, the, and what the photographer is looking to find. Um, and I think they're, they're all different situations. So, shall we move on? We move on, but we might move backwards. Yes. Oh, let's do this one. Oh, yes. Now, this, this is the most wonderful um, picture of someone called Louise Poua. She was 100 years old, and she lived alone in her little cottage, and she had this intense relationship with her goat and her dogs, and every, it kept her going and kept her alive 
because she had to go up the mountain every day for them to graze and to feed. And we can show another picture of her interior, I think, if we go on, or oh. something, or back. back. Yeah, that is her at home. And um, that is her cooking stove, and she's having her soup for lunch. And um, it's, it was just extraordinary that she could live this regular life all on her own with her animals. And they were her friends and they kept her, had kept her alive. And in this case, I think the, the uh, Nikon camera was definitely the best way forward. Although this, this interior was done on the large, large camera, yes. I thought I might go back to um, the, the lovely man with the pullover. Does that sound with his like pullover. pullover? The pullover. Him, yes. Oh yes. I know I know this is Mark's favourite picture because he chose it when he was in the VNA to go in his book called A Photographer and Their Objects. And um, this man was um, extraordinary because he made these things which are called Gerbe de Mariage and every time someone got married they have to have this sheaf of wheat at their wedding and they were in the Ardash, they still believe in lots of pre-Christian ideas. And this idea is that the girl might bring the evil spirits from her village to the next village. And so they put the sheep of corn down at the end of her village and set fire to it. And the young couple had to jump over the fire to get rid of the evil spirits before they could move on to the new village. And you may think this is history, but it isn't. They do it. He sells 20 of them every year, and they really believe it, all of them. So, um, we wanted to photograph this, him looking at his best. And so Patrick, my husband, who's a costume designer, went into his attic and got out and fitted him out with the right clothes for the shot. And I think this is a very interesting point because photography is very much about costume. It's what people are wearing, they express who they are. And it's very hard photographing rural life in Devon nowadays because most people wear baseball packs, packs and nylon zip up, waterproof, all in ones. And you know, the, the, the expressive use of costume is almost finished in the rural. Um, environment up here in well, where I am in North Devon, really. Let me just go back again slightly. Do you want to talk about the chestnut one, or should we go to the shepherd in the thunder and lightning? Oh, we can we can talk about the chestnut one. Yes, he was. Now these people who lived in the Ardèche, it's a high mountainous area, and because of that is why it has not been modernised, because the big lorries can't get up the steep mountain paths and they can't have supermarkets. So they still live, live, well they did when I was photographing the old way of life. And they were noble, wonderful people and they all, during the war the Marquis operated up there and they welcomed always through history people who were in trouble. And there's a huge number of Protestant communities up in the mountains when they were being persecuted by the Catholics. And these Protestants are the most wonderful people, and they're very active. And during the war, they welcomed the Jewish refugees up in the mountains, and they had literally thousands of them came up by train to the mountains and were taken care of until they could be smuggled into Switzerland. And this man and his wife had three children, three Jewish children, and they became part of their family, and they gave them French names, and they said, whatever you do, don't forget your name, and don't betray us, because if they did, they would have all been sent to concentration camps. And we said, you know, why did you do it? He said, what do you mean, why did you do it? Of course we did it. Why wouldn't we do it? it they're just amazing people. But um, they're also very sweet, because they have to totally ritualize way of life. And the midday meal is everything for them. You know, that's when they have stop, they eat, they have the pot of beer, 
And I was photographing this man. And I'll bring up the subject of costume again, because when I entered his workshop, he made baskets. I spotted this leather apron, all covered in knife marks, where his knife had slipped. So they wear it, so that the knife doesn't go into their gut when they're cutting the, the um, straw and the wicker. So I got him to put on the apron, and then I want, always like people to sit in a doorway, because you get the front light. I love, to me, the light in the eye is everything. And so he sits in the doorway with the dark behind him. But then his feet don't reach the ground, so then I have to get a stool for him to support his feet. And, you know, by the time I'd got the apron and got the knives and got the stool and everything, and the smell was coming from the kitchen, and it became totally overpowering. And at midday, he just got up and left, and went and had his, his midday meal. And so we were left outside. Well, luckily, there was a lovely um, well with fresh spring water. So we just drank the well water. And after he'd finished his pot of fire, he came back again and sat in, and we got the picture. Um, but, you know, he was a hero, really, this man. He gave his life for other people, and he wore baskets. So all these people were unbelievably special for me. And I got to know them, and I went back year after year, and I really was full of admiration for their very simple but noble way of life. I think we'll go to the shepherd, shall we? Yes. If we can find him. I think we went past him. No, we didn't. Other way. Here we are. Yes. And people people used to ask me, how did you find your your models? And actually I did have a shopping list, rather like um, Robin was saying earlier. People I felt I needed to have to photograph in order to complete the picture. And I used to go to the markets and um, I would pick people up, you know, if I liked the look of them, I'd say, can I photograph you? And nearly always they would say, yes, come back to the farm, yes, fine. And I thought he was a real movie star, this one, so I, I said, can I come and photograph you? And he had a herd of goats and we went up to the mountains where his herd was. And it was the year of the drought, and they hadn't had anything to eat, any fresh grass, for five months. And he was cutting branches from the trees and giving them leaves. And they were desperate for rain, and it was really serious. And while we were there, there was a clap of thunder and lightning, and it started to pour with rain. And so we all rushed back into the barn and sat there staring at the rain. And he, he, he almost had a kind of biblical look on his face. He was staring at the rain with the most intense gratitude, as if he was thanking God for it. And while we, and I thought, this is, a, a, I had my camera handy, of course, and got his look on his eye of super gratitude and, and pleasure. And then, suddenly, there was the most, a most huge explosion started going off over the valley, and gunfire. And I said, my God, what's going on? And he said, they're shooting at the clouds to bring the rain down, because they haven't got rain in their, in their next valley, and they believe <laughs> that if they shot it up into the sky, the rain would come down. But I'm afraid it didn't work, actually. <laughs> So, um, this is the one we wanted to talk about, anticipation. Oh, yes. Monsieur Pizzo. Yeah. Now, Monsieur Pizzo, again, lived all on his own, right at the top of the mountain, which got completely snowed in during the winter. And um, I went to see him every year for years and years and years, and we became really good friends. And um, he used to give me presents. And... As I left this time, he had he gave me this came out with his best cabbage, his best cabbage, and um, 
I could hear an enormous commotion going on inside the house. And, and um, as Chris would know, you know, we get photographers get a second sense that something's going to happen. And so you get in your position and you cock the shutter and you get your setting right because you know it's going to be, need to be on a fast speed. And so I just waited there and I knew something was going to happen. And Pizzo said, don't worry, it's just the dogs, they're playing with the kittens. And this dog came out with a kitten in its mouth. And um, I just managed to get the actual moment when the dog appeared with the kitten. The kitten was a bone, so I never thought I'd get the kitten in its mouth. And I wasn't sure that it was dead or alive, but actually it was still alive. And I'm afraid he had killed, he said, let him have fun and play with it. So this poor kitten was, was chased all around the yard for quite a long time until he finally finished it off. But I just wanted to say that so photographers have to be ready for the moment. And you don't need to know And you have to be ready for it. And then um, the one person who is got the right instinct, gets the picture. I think we'll press on. Oh, we've done that. Now, this is a book that Chris Killett gave me when it came out, because he, he was very impressed with Berger and with this book about the present life of, of Europe. And I, I read it as part of my preparation for writing about Tessa's pictures in the Vivarais. And one of the chapters is about um, <laughs> killing an animal, I think it was a cow actually, which has to take place in the winter. So I said, I think I need to go back in, in the winter to see this. And Tessa, who knew a lot more about killing pigs than I did, was somewhat hesitant. But we went. And we got the snow. Yes, because the pig killing has to happen when the temperature is well below freezing, because they don't have any refrigeration. And of course it'll go off, because it all takes quite a long time. And it flies. So it has to be uh, cold. And, it, and uh, so we turned up, me and Mark, at this... I said I didn't want to do it, but he said, you've got to do it. It's, part, it's, this, it's the most important... Well, I think I said, I'm going. No, that's right. <laughs> he said, I'm going. You, you don't have to come. And I, of course I did go. And... Um, Shall I get the next slide? Yes, yes. Oh uh, yes, so we, we missed the, the actual pig killing. I think is quite important to mention because um, it was done in a very dark in a farm, which I knew very well. I knew all the people there, and the, and it was in a dark stable. And this is the time when digital photography is so wonderful because digital film is much more sensitive than real film. And so you can photograph almost in the pitch dark bit. And also you can look on the back of your camera and see if you're getting it, you know, whereas with film you never know until later. Although of course with Polaroid film you do. But anyway, um, so there I was in the stable and the pig came out and there's a professional pig killer turned out. And all he had was a tiny knife and a piece of string. And the pig was led out by the farmer who, and the pig knew the farmer, they were his friends, and he wasn't scared, he didn't scream, and he laid, they laid him down on the pig bench, tied him down, and he thought he was going to have an injection, it was the vet or something, and he was perfectly fine. And then he, they did a quick stab in the artery, and the blood goes down into a bucket, where they, and they make blood pudding out of it. But they shielded the pig so that he couldn't see this was happening, and it didn't hurt him at all. And I stood right in front of his face and I thought, I'm going to photograph him and make sure that it's actually all right. And it was fine. I looked him in the eye and he looked me in the eye and he gradually faded out. And I felt much better about it because I realised that actually, if it's done well, in the old-fashioned way, it isn't a problem. And so moving on, they took the carcass to the village school which was run by the nuns. And um, 
being the old pro that I am, I realized that I wanted to have an aerial view because I wanted to photograph the guts of the pig being exposed. So I found a high wall, stood on top of the wall and looked down onto the pig and um, settled myself up there to photograph the whole process from above. And to my utter astonishment, the school turned up with all the young children to watch. And the children absolutely loved it. And they particularly loved the bit when they chopped his head off. They all they said, can't we do it again? So I think this thing of getting children to realize where their food comes from is a very good thing. And they in France, they love their food, they love their bacon, and they love their pigs, and it all works really well. Now, Simon, can I just take your advice? I think we finish at 10 past it. Yes, so we've got five minutes to more oh, I should just say that um, <laughs> Tess was once asked why she, there are no people in her photographs of North Devon, or very few, and she said, because James did it already. <laughs> So here we have the bent tree. Yes, I, I mostly did these pictures in the 90s with, uh, on my large format camera on Polaroid film. And um, I got very fascinated by these single trees which were left in the old days by the farmers. When they, when they did the hedges, they used to leave, leave a single tree for shade. And so I collected a lot of these wonderful single trees and photographed them. What else have we got? Now? We've got the oak. Oh yeah, oh. and then there were these oak forests, Tessel oak forests, which were originally grown for tannin, because it was, Stratton was a very big tannery town, and they made leather there for hundreds of years, very high quality, beautiful leather, saddles and harness and boots and handbag, and most people in North Devon had completely forgotten that these tannery towns, and, and this occupation which was so important, and the, the oak tree forests were just allowed to grow tall and grow away because they didn't need them anymore for the tannin. And now we move on to the murmurations. This is oh, the yes. two then I, I spent a lot of time photographing this murmuration, the star one. And uh, that, again, I did this in the 90s, long before there were digital cameras. Now it's easy to photograph. Mm -hmm with a digital camera, but then I was using the films. So I had to use close, right to the mouth you need to very fast film and go out at dusk. And it was so cold, the camera used to freeze up. <clears throat> so I had to, I found a camera which was just mechanical, didn't have any electricity or batteries. And um, went out night after night and got these pictures of the starlings and the murmurations, which had really, Fascinating. I didn't, I'm sure most, it's quite, most people know about it now, but in the 90s it wasn't something which people were very familiar with. Should we do the second one? Um, yes. So, sorry? I was just saying, do, should we do the second of the two murmurations? This yeah. is our last slide. It's our last slide? Yeah. Oh, right. Well, so there you are. So, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not, I now entirely use digital film. I love it, and I do an, a lot of work on the digital film after I've finished all kinds of manipulation. And I find it's rather like going back to art school. You can do anything you dream up, you can do. And it's very thrilling. And I'm actually working as hard as I ever did, despite my great age of 84. I've got going to Italy next week to do a huge website for an Italian um, estate, and i have just been taken on by Interiors magazine on contract, so if anyone thinks that you have to give up when you're old, please don't, it's not necessary. <laughs> Thank you very much for an example of your